You're listening to In Healthy Company with Dr. Tim Stevenson. In this podcast, we're all about mental health and general well-being. We'll be interviewing guests and providing a safe space for them to discuss any mental health issues. For me, holistic health is far more than just not being sick. Please remember we are unable to give health advice on an individual basis. However, please do feel free to email us with your issues at wellbeing at thehealthycompany.com and we may deal with them on the show. I'm talking to Lewis Hatchett and it really uh, has been a pleasure to be in healthy company with him. This conversation tonight was eye-opening to me even though I have known him for all of his life. I hope you enjoy it as well. And today I'm in healthy company with Lewis Hatchett, who I've known for many, many years. So, Lewis, thanks very much for joining us today. Thanks, Tim. And uh, if you forgive me, I'll tell the story how we first met when you were one day old. <laughs> and uh, Lewis was one day old and my daughter was one day old in the same hospital. And my wife swapped the babies round in their cots to the uh, amazement of Lewis's mother. And we've been family friends ever since despite that rocky start it's a good job she found it amusing so. mum always tells me this story of she's like imagine if we kept the ba- kept Laura <laughs> like what would have happened the butterfly effect of it all like it's such a it, and she was only telling it the other day I think because she? yeah she was telling it to my girlfriend when I said oh I just got off the phone with Tim yeah. and she was like oh the story <laughs> the amazing story so we she tells everybody it that she story. tells it all the time so, yeah well another thing that actually happened then Lewis, and, I, and I've asked you if I can talk about this, but, you know, was the fact that whenever you were born, there was a slight physical um, difficulty, deformity, infirmity, whatever we'll call it, and you can mm-hmm. explain it in a minute. But it was more the fact that we'd already become friends with your mum and your dad, like, really intimately in those mm-hmm. first few days. And it was strange to see whenever... Um, they were worried that there was something significantly wrong with you. Mm. And do you want to tell a story about what it actually was? And what? Yeah, well, it's, it's so interesting like having this conversation because you're there on the day yeah. when you're you guys are taking in all the information, of, yeah. and it's probably such a such a large moment in everyone's life, both my parents and and yourself, when you've just had Laura. Yeah. Um. So it's really interesting to find out sort of what happened from your end. But yeah, I was. I was diagnosed um, having been born with Poland syndrome, which is pretty rare now having looked into what it what it was as I've grown older, I've researched it and realizing it's about one in 100,000 people have it and manifests itself very differently to people who do get it. And for me, it meant that I was missing my right pectoral muscle and two ribs that were that are directly behind where that muscle should be. So fundamentally what's the only thing that's protecting my lung the upper right part of my chest is is just skin so I I know from hearing the story from mum was as soon as I was born the doctor just said oh he's got Poland syndrome but that again even that was really fortunate because I've met so many medical staff in my time now where they don't even know what it is Mm -hmm. because it's not very common Uh, and it just so happened that the guy then knew what it was and and then, yeah, then it's really interesting to hear maybe your side of, yeah, of what well, I, mum and I dad were reacting like. I remember speaking to them the evening after they'd spoken to the paediatrician and the paediatrician saying to them, uh, you know, look, you don't really need to worry about this. The only thing is he'll never become a professional cricketer and we won't play for England. Yeah. So. And then, yeah, I, 20 years later I became a professional cricketer. Yeah, and I love that. Yeah. For me, <laughs> that is great because it just, you know, it just uh, signifies the the non omnipotence of, of doctors, you know, we yeah. Did, yeah, he knew about it. But he didn't think about how and we'll talk about this later, but how your psychological strength and your determination would turn that round. It wasn't that you remembered that he'd said that no, yeah. <laughs> yeah. at one or two days old. <laughs> but, you know, I know because, you know, obviously it's like you know, your dad would have followed my sons playing football or whatever I always followed you playing cricket and so yeah. But I know what you've had to do to get to the top, and um, it's some of that sort of stuff that I want to talk to you about today. Yeah. So um, yeah, I mean, what what did it feel like when you made it as a professional? What what the, you know? How tell me a wee bit about that time and that transition? Straight away, the, um, the I, I remember the 
the, literally the day that I'd been told that I was going to sign a contract at Sussex, and that was my dream, just to to sign a contract at Sussex. I'm Sussex born lad and always lived here, and um, that was my literally my dream, and that was something I set out from a really early age. But that day, literally being told that I was going to um, to sign a contract was was unbelievable because it was it was literally the ten years I guess of that journey leading up to that and all the doubts and all the the um, literally this this journey from being introduced to cricket in the garden to then suddenly being given a professional contract was yeah, just but, crazy. But there's a lot in between. Were you at the work? Yeah, I so, saw you working in the in the in the. Um, in the nets at Sussex as a as a junior as a as a trainee or as a yeah, and I mean I can tell the story if yeah. if, yeah. if you want and and um... no you just I I, I talk too much on these podcasts <laughs> you, you, you go ahead thank yeah, you yeah well so it, like you said mentioned that the doctor had said that I wouldn't play I was never going to be able to play cricket and I guess fortunately is the way to look at it that my younger brother who was only a year younger fourteen fourteen months younger than me. Um, but he's fully able-bodied, fully able-bodied, and and just like anyone has to grow up, just having a younger sibling, you kind of just want to compete with them and just beat them in everything. <laughs> so fundamentally, when we get to around about seven or eight, our granddad, mum's dad, just gave us a cricket bat and ball at the time, and we're just playing around the garden. And I think on reflection, mum and dad were kind of a little bit standoffish because they that that whole he'll never play cricket was still yeah. ringing in yeah, their ears. Absolutely. Um, and we just cracked on and just I started playing. I just happened to be left-handed and start bowling against Brad. And that competition kind of grew and mum and dad were like, well, he's doing okay. My school didn't have any cricket at the time. And we decided to go to find a cricket club in the local area. And the cricket club that we found, I just fell in love with the game straight away. Just fell in love with competing, wanting to compete with guys around my age and above. I just wanted to be a bowler. I wanted to be an opening bowler. I was going. Dad was taking us to go and watch Brighton of Albion, and was we were going to watch Sussex play cricket. And when I was at the cricket, I was just drawn to watching bowlers bowl and wanted to do their job. And eventually, this this kind of idea of of becoming a professional cricketer kept growing until I, Mum and Dad tell me the story of one day I'd I'd seen um, Jason Gillespie, who's now the head coach yeah. of of Sussex, ironically. Um, but he was just playing for Australia at the time and I saw him in a restaurant and whilst I'm sitting there I kind of bang my fist on the table and say that's it I want to be a professional cricketer so from then on it was right how do we how do I do this as well as kind of contemplating the fact that I have my condition and no one's really done that before so go home um, and figure it out that I have to get into the Sussex age group but this is the like that's the way I've got to get in and to get into the age group I was about 14 15 at the time and to get into that squad they had trials coming up so went to the trials turn up at the trials and everyone's in this pristine kit having come from private schools and like I said my school didn't have cricket and was picking up scraps of of kit here and there um and we we go to this trial well I go to this trial day and there's about 50 kids and you know they're just so much better than me and knowing that they were only going to select 15 of 15 of us and I knew that these guys these kids were so much better than than I was I could see they were bowling faster I could see they were hitting the ball harder than I ever would so my ability was so much lower at the time and I wanted to try and get in that 15 so the only way I could see at the time to to do that was to ask questions and I would ask the coaches the most annoying questions of that right now coaching people I realized I would have annoyed myself <laughs> and, and I I see that uh, I, I'd go up to a, a a coach and say like how is he doing this how do I do that how do am I doing this okay just nag 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 um, and eventually they come to the day where they're kind of announcing the team and it's pretty brutal they're just pretty much reading it off a list get down to like number 13 like, Shit, it's not been me 14 oh, it's still not 15 Lewis Hatchett you're in and I just like squeezed my way into this oh. team and Brad fortunately was he we all that cricket in the garden had paid off because he was in the age group below he got into the Sussex squad the age group below so I was like, cool, I'm in the Sussex squad, I'm now representing. That was like a really great yeah, day for me. Yeah. That was my first real achievement in the sport. So I'm in this squad and then sort of throughout the summer there's an, there's X amount of games, let's say it was 10, and literally every week there was a game, a letter would turn up with the Sussex emblem stamped on the front and I knew it was the team sheet and I knew 11 were going to get selected for the next game and would open up the team sheet and I was always 
one of the four missing out. So that just carried on. Every every time the, the team sheet would turn up, I was not playing. And Dad got Dad could see I was getting frustrated, and and I was like not standing out. And you kind of have one year to prove yourself mm. before they reselect the teams. And getting to fifteen, sixteen, now they're thinking about who they select for academies and take you on and as you know in sport like yeah. it, once you're in that pathway it's it's a great place to be um but once you if you're just kind of out of it then it's much harder to get back in so i knew that because i wasn't getting an opportunity playing in the games and wasn't kind of getting in front of the coaches it was going to be really tough for me to to actually show what i could do and dad came up with the idea where he said well why don't you just ring up the coaches and go train and i was like what do you mean he goes ring up the head coach of sussex and go and train with them at their training day tomorrow. Like just go and ask to be a net bowler. And it's kind of like asking Chris Hutton at Brighton, can I just come and have a kick around with you lads or or, or um, yeah, United or Chelsea? Mm. Just, can I just turn up and train? No, it doesn't work like that. So I would. Dad gave me the phone. He found the phone number. It was like, don't come out of this room until you've done it. Don't come downstairs until you've rung this number. And I would just stand there rehearsing for like three hours what my lines of what I was going to say and sweating, couldn't dial the number and eventually plucked up the courage to ring. <laughs> it would go through to the to the coach and, hi, it's Lewis Hatchett. Can I, can I come and train with you guys tomorrow? Sorry, Lewis, no. Next week we'd come around, I'd ring up and, hey, it's Lewis Hatchett. Can I come and train with you guys? Sorry, dude, no. And literally would happen repeatedly until one day they just said, we, we were a guy down, we need someone to help out in the nets. And suddenly I'm thrown into this environment where I was going from trying to get autographs off these players the night before a game and then I'm training with them and stuck to the wall through sheer fear of not making a fool of myself. And I just saw that as an opportunity to learn from the best, see what they did. Uh, whether I did well or badly, it didn't really matter. I was just trying to learn and do well or or not it was inspirational it was it was not it was not an, a thing that i i was concerned concerned with but i would i did that so much i was only yeah 16 and i probably weighed about 70 kilos dripping wet at the time i was really skinny not very strong uh, and i was just bowling and bowling and bowling and my body was just not ready for it and was bowling one day in the nets and just suddenly felt my back like really painful. I had to stop. It was the first time I'd ever had to stop playing the sport. And because I wasn't on any sort of medical care at the at the club, wasn't uh, couldn't go privately, went through the NHS, it took them ages to find out that it was a stress fracture in my back, it took about six months to find it. Then I spent another six months in a back brace to, to fix it. And I was doing all my exams at, yeah, at, at, at a school with this goddamn back brace on corset thing it was ridiculous um, but my back eventually healed um, and I needed to go through a rehab program to get stronger I realized my body had failed me that was the most annoying thing I, I couldn't accept that my body had failed me I could accept that I wasn't going to get selected on cricket merit or ability skill wise but not having my body uh, like be accepted or, or having it fail me was something I just couldn't couldn't take so I would look at this leaderboard in the gym at Sussex because whilst this is all going on and I've spent now a year, 18 months out of the sport, all the guys that I was trying to compete against and work with and trying to get into the academies, they're off doing that. They're off playing yeah. second team reserve cricket and and I was stuck in this gym, not work, like working hard at my body. And I would literally work every day, weekends as well, so I'd have to give up going out and seeing my mates because this was what I wanted to do and eventually built my body up there was this gym board in the gym there was this board of like who was the fit the, the fitness scores of the players and I just looked at the best player and I was like that's where I want to be I want to be the best on that board I need to compete with that person so that when the time comes and they they select and they want to use uh, they they want to look at me but they I want to make sure that they can't turn to my physical ability and say no yeah especially with my condition because i already was pushing it uphill so i would work and work and work day and night getting my body fit and ready uh, and then i did i felt great i was rehabbed ready to go bowling so i was fully ready to go cricket season was over brilliant so there's no cricket going on and then the opportunity to meet to to go away to australia was put in front of me and this that was really what massive turning point for me because I was flown out the opposite, the other side of the world. But before I left was even more important, the fact that I sat down with the head coach who had kind of doubted me and 
had been working on all these players here in England and sort of progressed them, I said, look, what do I need to do? Give me a physical list of things I need to do in order to become a professional cricketer. So he wrote this page after page, a massive list, and he kind of giggled and let me go. So I went over to Australia and worked crazy hard at just ticking off those things on the list so that I knew I'd done everything that I could possibly do to to, to kind of please them and, yeah. and, and do what they said. Came home, knew I was better, but obviously being the other side of the world, you're not seen yeah, they're, they're not working in their face no you're not in their face they're working with the people here in England and I came back and I knew I'd got better I knew I was a bit better than some of the other guys but they were putting the opportunities for those guys mm -hmm. and I really had to kind of sit down and give them a bit of an ultimatum I was like look I'm better I'm ready to go uh, I want to play for Sussex this is my dream like, I've lived here this is literally everything that I want to do but I want an opportunity to be the opening bowler in the reserve side just please give me that opportunity and we managed to come to a deal where we had one month and there were three games in that month and I wanted to, I wanted to open the bowling. I said, just give me that one month. Let me do those three games opening the bowling. If I do well, I carry on doing that job. If I don't, I'll ride off in the sunset. You'll never see me again. I've given it my all. And in those three games, really fortunate, I took about 21 wickets in three games <laughs> and and they kind of looked at me and went, well, you've, you've done your job. Fair play. Um, you're going to have to carry on doing that job. So I carried on just opening the bowling reserve squad, just travelling around. I was still working in a like smoked salmon factory at the time, and just to put money in the, in my car, uh, put get money for putting petrol in my car. And um, <laughs> as we as we go sort of from game to game, I'm getting better. And then the coach, head coach comes to me, and goes, "We need you to travel with the first team now. We need you to jump on the bus. You're going to be carrying the drinks." So I was like, oh, "I'm carrying the drinks again. I'm this spare part again." But at least I'm doing it in the right side. Yeah. I'm now travelling around with like international cricketers, back of the bus. This was ridiculous for me. Um, still, my mates are kind of like going off to university, and and then I'm travelling around the, the country on this bus and just literally going from game to game, being water boy, like so, sorting everyone out for the games and and just being that spare part in the team until one game in London, where about 30 minutes before the game started, our overseas player rolled his ankle, couldn't play coach comes to me and goes you've got to open the bowling here's your cap here's your shirt good luck first batsman you've got to bowl against is the England captain I was like holy crap this is really happening straight away rung mum and dad like you better run up you better fly up the M25 and yeah. get here because um, I'm just about to make my professional debut and I remember that game so well I was first batsman I bowled to Andrew Strauss the England captain at the time and, it, and actually to this day that game was incredible there was 22 players in that game and 15 of them were playing international cricket and then there was me I didn't have a name and number on my shirt when they announced me to the crowd when I came onto a bowl and opened the bowl in there was this like cry of who behind me and they were they were my own fans <laughs> <laughs> that were that didn't have a clue who I was um, but I got through that game like I, I met I, I really was incredibly nervous but I, I got through that game and took a couple of wickets Moved on to the next game, and I thought, well, the guy's fit again. I'm going to slot out, and he'll slot back in. But they dropped someone else and kept me in, and that was really what changed my life. I took five wickets in the first innings in that game, and that was the moment when I was walking off, kind of celebrating to the crowd what I'd just achieved, go and change room, get changed, showered, go back to get in the car, and that was the moment. That head coach came up to me, grabbed me by the shoulder, the guy who had really like doubted me and and um, and had kind of laughed at me when I said what I wanted to do, turned to me and said, "We're going to offer you a, a professional contract. You've you've done it." And yeah, I look back and actually see like the the guys that I was competing against, and they were the ones that didn't really make it in the end. And I did, and and it was really down to that kind of now I can confidently say it was just kind of sheer determination to just not let it go. Um, well, and then, if you, if you listen to listen to a podcast of Donald Robbie Savage, it's very similar. You know, yeah. he he says, you know, he says he's not the best footballer in the world, but any anybody who makes it professional has got a certain amount of talent, and then has worked on it because it's their passion. Mm. You know, he talks about it as being his, um, you know, that he's addicted to it, mm. and he's addicted to football, and he's still in it. But like for playing it, he was addicted to it, and you've just proved that. You know, with you know, the, the people say, oh, if you want something, you go and you get it. 
doesn't always work, but my goodness, that's a story of how it did work. Yeah, yeah, it's, um, I actually, I, and it took me a long time to realise that my biggest strength was my drive, and that, and that that can just be pointed in any direction. Absolutely. Um, so even when I made it as a pro, like, that, that whole world changed because your drive now needs to be, how do you stay in the team? And it, and sort of a, uh, the, the reflection part I have now was, how did I actually stay in professional cricket for for six years with my condition no one had done that i really should never have been there in the first place um and like the fundamental part was just i was so driven to continuously get better um and well, it's, it, we were talking earlier on it is definitely an impairment you know and, yeah and we don't we shouldn't dwell on it no but we should also acknowledge that actually you have done you know you've, you've developed the left arm bowling but you don't just run with your right arm down by your side no you no you need the strength of everything well yeah um, I, I mean i didn't really mention what the sort of physical impairments are with it so the fact that i'm only protected by skin from my lung means that if i was to be hit by a cricket ball at such high speed then the the injuries are from like a slight winding to fatally killing me um there's also things like the fact that because i'm missing this such a large muscle on my right side my right shoulder has compensated to do that role and that's meant that those muscles are like highly active highly they're a lot stronger than they probably need to be um from that side and doing a job that they're not meant to and that hitches my shoulder up a little bit higher that means i get highly active traps which cause headaches down one side of my head so there's all these things i've had to manage throughout it and i still manage them daily but um i've always said like they they would that's the kind of little price i paid for being able to to get sort of a high high performance world and high achieving world and and everyone has a price to pay when you get to to that level I, no one ever reaches that high level and and hasn't had something happen to them where it's it's plain sailing yeah. that was mine it was more of a physical physical side and um, but yeah. t- t- I, I wanted to talk to you about the the other end of that and mm. it's really interesting to me about what what happens that I've seen so many of my friends in football who you know get to the end of their career and and suddenly it's gone overnight tell mm. me uh, tell me what it, how it happened mm. and then you know what it felt like and how you yeah so it. like i said six years of playing and and it was july 2016 i was literally playing the best cricket i'd ever played i was really in a good place with the coach that i was working with at the time I'd worked on my body, um, we'll get onto it later, but I took up yoga five years ago now, sort of in 2014, 15, really got my body in a great place. Um, and I was injury free, which is probably the most important thing. And I was consistently being able to train and improve and this progression was going up and getting ready for playing against Pakistan. They were over the tour and I was about to, I was due to play in that was game. That, was that the same year you played against Australia? No, the, the, Australia, the Australia game was... Oh God! Like 2013, maybe a few. Can years I just before. interrupt because yeah. that was one of my proudest moments whenever <laughs> you took a wicket in that game. Yeah, and I was telling everybody around them the story of how. You know, yeah, definitely the Australia game was a really big highlight. Just being able to play against like international guys um, and that level, and just the. Was um, it just one or two wickets you took? I took about four or five well, in the game. Must, yeah, must, I, I think must have been in the bar. <laughs> <for the last laughs> yeah. Yeah, Celebrating it's... the first two. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, going going back to this Pakistan yeah. in 2016, and this game against Pakistan was coming up. I was playing so well, and ready to play in that game. Really ready to like excel, because I just was in such a good place, mm. physically, tactically, mentally, ready to go. Uh, and playing in this warm-up game just to get ready, just to turn my arm over, really get some sort of mileage in my legs, and bowled this one ball and, like, bang, hurt, felt this searing pain, tried to bowl another ball, that was it, couldn't walk, had to be kind of helped off the pitch. Um, and I, I knew what the pain was, like, I knew a similar pain, but I couldn't accept it at the time. I was really, really protective, so I got really kind of aggressive towards the, the physio at the time because he wanted to send me an MRI that night. I knew I had to go, so I did. But I was like, MRI doesn't show anything and it never has and it's not. I'm going to find out the same sort of thing. Uh, went for the MRI, next morning results come in and the phone call was the toughest phone call because I could just tell by the the tone of the voice of physio as soon as he, he I answered the phone, he was like, it's another, it's a f- bad stress fracture in your back. 
but not only that, it's now worse than what it's ever been before. Um, you need to come in and we've got to go, you've got to stop bowling. Literally, that was I think that was the words that really shook me. It was like, got, you know the pro, it was like, you know the plan, stop bowling, you can't do anything. And I kind of really had instantly knew where this might head, just I guess from the feel, intuitively knowing my body at the time. Mm. But I, that afternoon, I went into... Um, I went into the, I went into the ground. It's so vivid. I I went up to the physio and I was literally walked through the doors, saw the physio, and he just said, "You're right, mate." And I broke down. I just ran out of the room. I broke down. I went into the car park. Um, I hid behind a car. Um, I was like literally on the floor crying. I'd rung I'd rung my dad, and I'd said um, because I hadn't I hadn't actually told anyone that I'd had the phone call in the morning. And I told Dad that I would just got the news that I that I had this injury, and he he'd never really shown. It was just like a really interesting phrase. He just said, "Lewis, I'm so sorry." But the way he said it, um, that sent me. I had to put the phone down straight away. I was in tears again, and it was just a really really tough, God, like hour or two. Really, just every all the emotion just instantly came bawling out of me. Um, but then I went into, right, what is it? Can we fix it? And fundamentally went to go see the surgeon for the next few weeks. And, and it was, this is not a case of if this is going to happen again, it's a case of when. What had happened was I was getting a chronic area of the bone that was that was kept fracturing over time. And um, and then it had this really bad break that was starting to work towards the lamina, towards the mm-hmm. spinal cord. And then you're kind of in unknown territory of what mm-hmm. could possibly go wrong there. So very quickly had to make the decision to to call it time, and that was it. That was that was actually the last time I'd played cricket for for Sussex, and it was really weird actually. I walked off that game that day, and the, one of the umpires was a guy I knew locally, and I said I I don't think I'll wear another. I, I said to him I don't think I'll wear a Sussex shirt ever again, and I just said it kind of flippantly, mm. but it was almost like I knew and. Mm. Um, and yeah, that then call, calling that that time on my my career was, was so quick, and um, it just took a little while to to really sink in because it didn't seem real. I don't think it ever seems real. I think that's the thing we spoke about this before, mm-hmm. and whether it was Robbie or yourself, just being a, around a sporting environment, it doesn't seem real because you kind of feel like there's this voice in your head. It's like, oh, it's all right. I'll be back tomorrow. I'll. I'll um, but when I'll you know tomorrow. you'll not be back tomorrow. Yeah. So it's not when you know you're not going to be back, and that that's the end. Yeah. And you know, as I've said before, I'm just the doctor at the team, and whenever it was no longer part of my life, it was such a big change. Yeah. And you just suddenly you're not part of that coach. You're not getting on that coach mm. anymore. And um, it is it is weird. It's tough on somebody like you, who's so passionate about it. I already had another career, mm. but. Um, what I want to bring out of this conversation is really more about the you know how you've built on that you know you mm. haven't just felt sorry for yourself and and you know you've every every reason I don't like the words feeling sorry for yourself that's quite negative it's quite insulting to people but sometimes people just say oh well you know why me and you know yes there is why me but you could also say for you you know well actually you know, it's understandable that that fracture happened because there were different stresses yeah. in your body yeah. because of the way you would spin to get a good ball mm. because you hadn't necessarily got the exact same formation on the right side of your yeah, chest. Symmetry, you're the right. yeah. yeah, So really what we should do is turn that round and look at how fantastic it was that you had six years of professional cricket, the thing mm. you loved. I know how many people would love to do that. You know, how many cricket fans would love to say they played for Sussex for six years? Yeah, I, I always Unless use you're not that. A Sussex fan. Yeah, I, I yeah, of course, yeah, <laughs> I'm not a Sussex fan. I always use that. I think that's especially when I'm giving a talk and 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 speaking to people. I always say like, I could look at everything in a in two different ways. I could look at it that I'm so annoyed that I'll never get to play professional cricket again, but I'm incredibly grateful for the fact that I. I got six years in that sport and I can take what I learned from that period and move it forward into my life. I could also tell the story about how I'm so frustrated I'll never have this right side of my body being like functioning as it yeah. as it could. Um, but I'm so thankful for my left side and all the amazing things that I can do with my body right now. So, But, but also you can look at your right side and say that 
has made you part of the person you are obviously physically as part totally, of the person yeah. you are but actually the strength that you have and, and and this this is what we want to go on to talk about now about what you're doing now and what strengths you're bringing mm. and part of all of our journeys and part of all of our you know the reason perhaps some of us are better at talking about mental health problems is we've maybe had them ourselves or we've had some adversity that we've had to deal with and it makes us a stronger person and mm -hmm. someone that is more able to help someone else and tell, tell us a wee bit about what you're doing now because it, it ties really into you know the whole thing about the healthy company and, yeah. and positive thinking and mindfulness and and you 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 do a bit of it all yeah and you uh, uh, pardon me talking away here I suppose it's my own podcast, so I can say that. But uh, um, I, I spoke to my uncle whenever I was a kid about, you know, he was a psychiatrist and I was at university and learning about psychology. And I remember saying him to you, you know, do you use Freud? Do you use Beck? You know, Aaron, Aaron you know, and, and I said, well, who, who, do you, who do you pick? He says, Tim, I use whoever, you know, whatever's right for that individual. Mm. You know, you don't just take a textbook off and tick off a list. You've already got a whole uh, holistic view of well-being mm. that is not just, uh, and that's why we get, talk so much. Mm, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, it is not just about physical well-being. It's not just about psychological well-being. It's not just about high performance. It's about all of them together. Yeah. All of them make up the successful, the happy, the the well, the the individual. Yeah, totally. I I, I mean I. That that period of just losing my career really then set apart, set into motion sort of where I'm at at now. Really, I, I I'd been pretty proactive throughout my career about what I wanted to do after my career, whether that was consciously or subconsciously thinking that my condition was going to be something that could have an effect on where my career was going to go. Um, I I knew that I needed to have something out because I think I was so aware of just cricket's not going to last forever yeah <laughs> and any sport doesn't and any sporting career doesn't last forever so i was pretty savvy and just networking myself around the area um but when the trauma of losing my career actually happened i was pretty quick and went in to help my brother in his business and grow that so i kind of just fell into that kept myself busy for a bit yeah. but fundamentally realized that that wasn't what i wanted to to do that wasn't where my strengths lie I was starting to talk about my my condition I'd had an art gar uh, an article done in the Guardian which really started to to gain people's understanding of what my story was and I started doing more public speaking on it and again the more awareness that people started to hear my story they started to pick out sort of the bits of what they found valuable so that mindset that drive that determination and how they could see it transferring into businesses or, or their own lives whatever it was but then my own personal stuff, I was like, what do I, what can I do? Like, what do I want to work on? And, and I, you mentioned I used yoga was something I'd done sort of now, yeah, now five years ago. Um, and actually before, as I finished my career, I went in, I tried to become going to Paralympic swimming. I spent a year in training for Paralympic swimming and went and got assessed by team, the, the GB swimming squad and, and got told no, like my condition was not classified in one of their classifications they had so I was left in this really weird space where I I didn't uh, I was neither unable bodied or fully able bodied to compete in fully able bodied sport but neither unable bodied enough to compete in para sport so left in this really really weird realm and I felt like I'd re-retired from sport again when that happened and that triggered um doing probably the most natural thing that I did which was I traveled all the way out to Hawaii and learned to become a yoga teacher so I travelled out there wanting to understand the the more philosophical side of of yoga. Also, who doesn't want to do it in Hawaii? Because yeah. it's an amazing opportunity. That that whole week or two of just planning that, literally, I'd I'd booked to go to Hawaii about three weeks before I went because it came about through a friend. I said I'd mentioned to them that I wanted to become a yoga teacher and find a way to teach yoga in a different way and take the principles and use it with what I know. Um, and they said, oh, there's this opportunity in Hawaii. Do you want to do it? And I turned to my parents and they were like, look, since you're, you've finished, you haven't really done anything to look after yourself. Go, just go and do it. And what an experience it was. Went being out in the big island in Hawaii and, and really threw myself into this world of, of yoga and the, the philosophical side, the, 
the um, the real teachings of it all and lived it for for these this time I was out there these three weeks and I'd never done that I'd went over there as a really egotistical sportsman just banging my chest wanting to um, to kind of go over there find the physical info bring it over and, and use that but what I learned over there was really just a way of living and understanding it a lot a lot better so when I came back I was like well I like what I've learned there but I feel there's an element of being able to teach this stuff to people in a much more simple way without making them join the ashram without making them sort of feel they need to burn all their clothes and and get hemp trousers and, and that was it I, I felt there was a way that I could draw on everything that I'd done I was a personal trainer and and obviously professional sportsman and then had this arm added into to what I was doing and then kind of came up with the brand the sport yogi and that was where it kind of really just came about just one day you know, walking the dog I was like wow, I want to combine yoga and sport and I'm a yogi and a sportsman and just mashed them together but then I wanted to find a way to to make it really accessible to people so that people could do it in their own time I was I'd used an app myself to to learn yoga. I'd never really gone into classes because too took too long. They weren't really the crowd that I wanted to be mm-hmm. around at the time, um, and I wanted to do it on my own. I wanted to. I was traveling from game to game at the time. I, I couldn't take a yoga teacher with me everywhere I went. I was like, right, I need something in my pocket. So I'd seen that doing something using a device had worked, but also the fact that just the way it was communicated was just a little bit didn't resonate with the everyday person i was trying to get friends of mine involved because especially teammates of mine they'd seen that it was having a really a great benefit to my my physical game i wasn't getting injured and i was someone who was always getting injured so they were like how do i get into yoga i'd show them the app and they're like oh god it's not for me like that's that's too much so this all these things started like ticking along and i just thought well how can i do this myself and yeah fast forward really and I ended up creating my own online platform where now I teach people online to these methods of just teaching classes for like movement making your body feel better and then things like breathing practices and and meditations just so that they're designed to be really simple practical um, that you can use in your everyday and this and this is something that's still new but it's massively the way I want to go and grow it and as well as working with elite sports teams to use these principles um, and work in high pressurized situations to have I fundamentally look at it as having the tools to be able to manage your physical and mental well-being and and then from that that just opens up so many different doorways and it's so multifaceted it's almost Absolutely. so much to talk about we were talk we were talking earlier on about the, the business side of this and and talking you know successful businessman and business folk and uh, you know the whole the whole point of uh, being able to de- manage under pressure, mm. and you know the, the the being mindful, being in the moment, being able to um, not not focus from the point of view of being in some weird box of a zone that is getting rid of everything else, but actually accepting where you are, taking that big deep breath, counting to ten whatever method people use. I think that the thing I've realized is that if I'm talking to people who maybe have had some CBT or have had some, you know, mindfulness coaching or whatever, it is totally uh, ridiculous to think that my method of teaching it is better than everybody else's. Mm. And so what I always say is, look, I'm going to give you a whole lot of wee things here and see if they help. And, you know, take from the whatever helps you. There may be one out of the seven or eight things we chat about that helps you. And so having different teachers coming at the same general principles, but having different examples, different approaches, actually enriches everybody's understanding of it. Yeah. So there's, there's room for, um, you know, uh, there's room for many teachers. But also, I think uh, I mentioned to you earlier on, you shouldn't doubt the fact that what you've picked up in those years, you know, the last 15 years, mm. getting to where you are and battling your way to where you are and building up your emotional strengths, you're at least as entitled to talk about what brings emotional strength to mm. people as me 
or someone that else that has been studying it and talking about it for 20 years. Yeah. Because you've felt it, you've used it, you've understood it, and you know it works. Mm. So Yeah, I think it's that that's massively been um, something that I need to, I guess, lean on a little bit more myself, is the fact that I've come from this, I'm only 29, and I've I've had these experiences, but I've learned all this stuff fairly early. It's, it's usually people that they tend to learn it a little bit later on in life where they kind of get to asking themselves, like, well, what is this all about? Mm-hmm. Question, and, and, and I've had that really early. Yeah. I had that at 26, yeah. like, right, what is... That was the biggest thing when I lost was the loss of identity. When I lost my career, it was my loss of identity because I would lost the ability for people to come up to me and the question that would always not drive me mad but would terrify me was, what are you up to, Lou? Like that simple question, like, what are you up to? And and most of the time my answer was, I'm training for this game, I'm in camp at the moment, or the season's going well, I'm bowling well, whatever it is. And that question of, like, what are you up to, Lou? And I'm like, well, I, I can't answer you with those questions anymore, and I don't really know what's going up at the moment. Like, what am I, what am I doing? So... The whole realization that Lewis Hatchett as a cricketer was just one part of my life, and that was a shirt that I wore. But it should never have changed who Lewis is. Now I, Lewis myself, and just doing something different. The what has changed, but who? Different shirt. Who? who who's? Yeah, yeah different shirt. Uh, the who's yeah. the same, yeah. but the what is different. And um, that was a really big, I guess, realization for me, and uh, uh, why all this stuff has become really important for me um and the fact that yeah you're right i i can lean on my professional sport background really hone in that experience and now the fact that i'm actually teaching it and doing it all myself with these yoga principles mindfulness uh, movement practices whatever it is uh, and just helping people so I, i look at it as improving your performance in sport and life yeah because you um it's your life that's going to be all these principles you, you're going to take these wherever you go um, and yeah if you're working with a sportsman you want to improve the performance side there you want to get them exactly. to perform under pressure yeah. and that, and you're right having different teachers um, I'm not ta- I'm not teaching anyone anything differently that a, a yoga teacher or mindfulness teacher might be teaching in, in Brighton somewhere or anywhere around the country or around the world but I'm just packaging it differently I'm just trying I'm re- trying to resonate with a a group of people that I know where I came from um, that need it, but they need it to be told to them in a way that maybe they've never heard it before. And if I can communicate that in the right way, then that's a job well done. And that's that's where we start to open the door a little bit. We start to we start to fight away. You get so many people that fight it because of how they give it a stereotypical view. They they think yoga and mindfulness is is for Buddhist monks, hippies, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. yogas for skinny white women in, mm-hmm. that enjoy latte every now and then. Like that's that's how they kind of view it, um, and that's how I viewed it because I that's exactly how I saw it. So the whole idea is to break that demographic down and walk into a room and go, right, everyone, this is who I am, and this is how I want to teach it to you, and we're going to learn the principles along the way and see how we can add them into your life and see where your pro- issues are lie and what you want to learn and take from it and. Yeah, I think when you're working with people, like the communication is the the, the most valuable part of, of understanding how to get it across. Whenever I think about you over the last few years, I remember a very sad time when you lost a friend. And uh, I asked you before if you minded me talking mm. about this. And um, do you feel any of your of your training or is there anything in the past that helped you do deal with that or anything with the way you dealt with that that made you better person now and better able to help other people yeah i think well so yeah we sadly lost one of our teammates in a really tragic event that he that occurred over over new year's eve one year um and his name was matthew hobden he died at 22 so he's a really young guy he's a very very good player Um, but I, I was away in Australia at the time when it happened. Um, it was such a, a weird moment. I woke up because everyone was over here and it was during the day. And then I woke up um, in Australia to just this huge amount of text messages. I had to go through them all to figure out where it all come from. 
had my mum ring me going like I'm so sorry like give us a call as soon as you and then suddenly piece together what actually happened um, and it was really strange because I wasn't I, I could see everyone was messaging each other saying that they were turning up to the ground they were going to support each other uh, and I was literally in Australia the great thing at the time was that the captain um, of the team rung me there was about three of us in the team that weren't in the country at the time so one was in New Zealand the other one was in Australia out there with me um, and then he rung us all individually and said like look whatever happens like we're literally other end of the phone give us a shout but luckily I'd been out in, in Adelaide f before and I had a re I've got a really strong tight friendship group out there and I just I just came clean I was like this is what's happened and it was on the news they found it they yeah. they saw it themselves went to training literally that night and they were like whatever you want to do we'll do it and and I just trained I just trained as normal and I, I let cricket be the thing I was like do you know what Matt would would want us to just carry on playing cricket um and I'm going to I'm going to honor him by doing what I was doing with him when I came back and and it hit me emotionally one random night whilst I was out there just because I think it all just really hit home what happened but yeah the I think I guess actually by then I hadn't really learned the strategies I, I know yeah. now because just more the the able to deal it deal with it but I think that was a great great reflection of how sport is just a family as well yeah. uh, so I just felt that real sport at that time I, I didn't really use the techniques that I learned now to deal with it I think right then it was actually the sporting family that I had that just guided me through Thank that period through yeah. yeah it's it's no different from having a, a family like you you normally would they're just guys that just wear a shirt like you do and they're human beings at the end of the day they they understand and it was just such an unfortunate series of events really then and um yeah on reflection it's it's it was that cricket family that that got us through do you think any aspect of that well i mean i'm actually asking you the question i'm i'm suggesting the answer really <laughs> that that i think that also makes you a stronger person mm. when when that awful thing happens and you've got to come through it you mm. know and and I, I say to people when people lose someone that you you don't have to torture yourself forever mm. that something awful like that has happened you know and you don't have to feel guilty that you're the survivor or that you're the one that's still having a good time in life mm. you can still be sad about it you know, I don't ask people to be to say, "Oh yeah, so and so's died," and "Oh yeah, life's great, isn't it?" Well, no, there is a part of the life is missing because that lovely person is no longer there. But you don't have to let it torture yourself. So it's yeah. that sort of cognitive restructuring of, of saying, it's important to remember the good times. Remember, mm. you know, change that round a little bit rather than remembering the tragedy. Remember the good, and remember the good parts of it. It's kind of what we talk about mindfulness in in like performance it's, mm. it's about knowing that that distraction or that event is there and and realizing that you have a choice to either be consumed by it or you can just know it's there and, and actually carry on with in a sporting environment we talk about the task that you're it's at hand and whatever it is you're trying to perform but if you think about it from more of a, a, a life structure it's that you're you're aware of that event that happened in this part of you that is sad and you can yes you can choose to engage with it and really allow it to consume you or you can just accept that it's there and just carry on with your task which is your life and and i, I often point and point to the bookshelf at the minute but i often point when i'm talking to patients about you know that's the sort of thing that will always be on your emotional bookshelf mm -hmm. you're not trying to hide it under the carpet or pretend that it doesn't matter or pretend that it didn't happen you know it's actually there but it doesn't have to be, you don't have to be reading that book all day, every day. Mm. That book doesn't have to change your, you know, dominate your life. Yeah. It's changed your life in a certain way, the same as any book and a bookshelf does. But that book that you're reading and those notes effectively that you've scribbled down in your head over that time, you're just, you're, you're not filing it away. You're, you're, you're putting it somewhere that doesn't have to be in your face all day, every day. Mm. Yeah. I, I think that's a very similar thing to when you, in sport, when you lose your career as well, like, the the emotional turmoil you put yourself through by feeling like well I know and I know I'll go through it this year because I'm still I didn't choose to leave the sport I didn't walk away because of an of like older age and feel like I can't keep up anymore I can compete at that level I just know that if I was to go into that sport now and after a few months of training and, and games 
I'd be starting to have the same reoccurrences happen. I can now only play like once a weekend going into the summer. And it's that feeling of like, I could jump the fence and go and do that again. And that, that I will know that I will have those feelings again. But for me, it's about understanding I have those feelings, knowing I have them, and then what's my choice from then on? Do I choose to just remind myself of what I've learned from it, the stories and where I'm at now, and be happy with what I've got now and, and, and actually motivate myself to, to continue the work that I'm doing? And that's that actually is now, over the last few months, has really become a motivation of mine of like really starting to see this new identity appearing uh, and work towards it and just keep keep going with it and it's it's exciting because every day is different now so yeah. but knowing that those issues could arise at any moment and i w- will not have a warning sign i won't know when it's going to happen but i know they'll come but i at least have a strategy i have ways of dealing with it and um again that's what i'm thankful for having those processes and th- those practices in place and, process. and i think you know Building up those strategies is building up your emotional, your physical resilience, your emotional intelligence. Yeah. All those different words, but they all mean the same thing. You know, mm. you're you're have got reserve in the system to deal with the the tragedies when they happen yeah. and, and 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 the sad bits when they happen. But actually, that we should be looking at optimizing the happy things and optimizing the the positive. You know, we were talking earlier on about words and the power of words and the way we speak to ourselves. Yeah. And don't be using words like, come on, pull yourself together, get on with it. You know, and similarly, don't be saying, oh, that's awful. You know, I'm so sad that you've had to give up your career. Well, I'm sad that you had to give up your career, but I'm really delighted that you're doing so well in what you're doing. Mm. So, you know, and there's, there is, it doesn't mean there's a positive in absolutely everything, but you can take something positive and you can build on it. Absolutely. I'm a massive believer in um, the, the power of our words that we not only tell other people because the, the words we have on other people have an impact on people and, and actually the more the words that we tell ourselves because I, I really believe that if what we tell ourselves is positive and we continuously, whether we visualise it in our head and we visualise, I'm a huge visual believer and visualisation I, I really believe works and if you visualise it, visualise it, that you can actually happen and I use a, re- a story... Um, of how this worked for me was during my period of time when I was about 16, 17 and I was injured. That first injury in my back had happened and I really wanted to improve my body. I knew that I needed to make sure that my body was fitter. So what did I need to do? I needed to run more, get stronger, all these different things. And I was at home, mum and dad's, and I was putting on my shoes to go out for a run late at night. It was cold, wet outside and mum's like, where the hell are you going? Like, don't, she caught me at the front door. I was like, just get to bed. Like, And I was like, no, I've got to go to, on this run. That's what I've got to do. It's the next stepping stone I need to get to. But as I was out on the run, I would always visualise this story in my head. I would visualise someone writing an article about my story, almost like writing my own <laughs> advert. Because so I was writing, because yeah. I was really inspired at the time by, I think it was Adidas. Yeah, it was Adidas had done the Impossible Was Nothing um, campaign. And I was just so inspired by the videos they were putting out there for their adverts. I almost visualized my own advert and I would visualize this this article being written about my story about me overcoming my my condition and making it as a professional cricketer so every run I would go out I would visualize this and every time I was working out and I would have a, like a negative thought I would visualize this story like no I can I can achieve something that's not been done before and then the last little bit when I was on this run running home there's a little hill and I would have like my little rocky moment up the hill and as I'm running up the hill, I would visualise signing a contract. I would visualise everyone I was competing against, the guys that the coaches were really rating over me, and them being in bed, not doing anything, and me writing, signing my name on that contract. I would do that continuously. Every time that something negative would happen to me, I'd just go straight back to this visualisation, and everything was about driving towards that visualisation. Until three years later, I signed a contract, exactly how I'd visualised it, and then six years later... The Guardian do an article on my my condition and it was exactly how I'd seen it. And it was just this ability to, to everything that was about me just oozed towards this visualisation. And it was positive self-talk. It was didn't mean that there weren't negative thoughts in there. It was just the ability to realise that they were negative and go, oh, I'm, that, I could be choosing to be consumed by this negative thought or I can choose to visualise on this really cool idea that I have and it's just what what does that 
what does that visualization really look like? Does it mean I could visualize playing for Sussex? But what are the steps? What are the little stories that are going up to make that visualization real? Okay, it means that I need to be working hard in the gym. I need to be working detailed on my body, detailed on my skill, detailed on my, my eating and everything to make sure that, yes, I was working harder than everyone else because I had effectively less than others. But that's what I needed to do to, to create that story. And, and, and it happened. That was... I use that one really. It's so tangible for people. Oh, absolutely. Because I can show them the article as well. Yeah. And go, Here it is. Yeah. And this is the story. This is what I thought. Have and you got the article and, on your website? Yeah. Well, yeah, I do. Yeah. Oh, good luck. Because yeah. we'll promote that in a wee minute as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we certainly shall. Because, you know, all this, these things are about in the healthy company. And I was thinking how we wind this up. And I don't want to wind it up yet. Yeah. Because I've got a few more examples myself. But you are definitely somebody who it is in healthy company with mm. you know it really is wonderful to talk to you. um and one one last thing i w just wanted to talk about going on with your 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 example there of visualization and then power then the words i often get people to think about you know whenever you you, you get those immediate thoughts of well you know i'm not going to be able to do this i'm rubbish at that in fact i'm crap at everything at the minute challenge every single one of those negative thoughts challenge everyone and the silly example i always give is like you're cooking the sunday dinner and you burn the sunday dinner and you say right well oh my goodness i'm a failure as a cook i'm a failure as a husband in fact i'm rubbish as a dad in fact i'm absolutely rubbish at everything and you know you can really catastrophize and mm. and, and drag yourself down and challenge each and every one of those so only burnt the sunday dinner it was only a five pound chicken from the co-op um, you know, I'm going to stir fry some vegetables and coconut milk and actually, oh, I'm not a bad cook. And actually, I only answered the phone to my son. He was needing a chat. Not a bad dad either. Mm. And you can answer every negative thing with something that is less negative. It yeah. doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, you don't have to come up and say, look, I'm Jimmy Oliver. I'm the best cook in the world. Oh, I'm the best dad in the world. You're probably not. But, you know, you can challenge every negative thing with a positive and usually coming out a lot, feeling a lot better. You know, mm. If you mark how you'd felt at the start of that, and then mark it at the end, you'd feel a lot better. Yeah, totally. Again, Lewis, thanks so much for chatting to me today. It's, it has been enlightening for me. Tell me a wee bit more about how people can find out more about you. Yeah, so um, I guess more about my personal journey and my story, That that's I send people to www.lewishatchet.com. But anything to do with the the well being, the health, and the physical, uh, the physical and the mental health platform that I have is www.thesportyogi.com, um, and so anyone can get me on on either of those. I hope loads of people will be t tapping on that there because yeah. I, I'm really interested in it, and you've, we've spoken about it. Excellent, fantastic. Thank you very much, Lewis. No worries, Tim. Thank you so much. I've been in a healthy company with Lewis Hatchett, and I think you'll agree he's an inspirational young man. He's a real good example of how you know we can deal with adversity in different ways. Sometimes we can't overcome them, but whatever we do, we can change the way they make us feel, even if it's only slightly. But certainly in Lewis's situation, you can see that he has taken everything positive he could possibly take from the challenges he's been dealt with, and I hope you find his story inspiring. You can find out much more at my website, thehealthycompany.com. If there are any areas of health and wellbeing that you would like us to explore in future podcasts, or you have any feedback, then please do email me at wellbeing at thehealthycompany.com. Thanks for listening and see you next time.